Hi everyone, my name is James Grime and this is Maths World UK and we're dedicated to creating the UK's first National Mathematics Discovery Centre which would be a place where people can come to explore maths in a hands-on and interactive way which does exist in other countries but doesn't exist in the UK and so to that end we created a touring exhibition uh, something that can visit uh, science centres in the UK and then Covid happened so we began to think, is there something that we can do beyond the exhibition, a way for people to explore maths at home? So we've decided to create a series of videos where I get to talk to some of my favourite mathematicians and I'll be asking them how they got into maths and what do they do now. But I'll be asking each of them to share something that we can all explore at home. So it might be something mathematical that we can play with or investigate at home. So I'm delighted that our first guest is one of the UK's best maths communicators. It's Rob Easterway. Uh, Rob Easterway is a best-selling author of books like uh, Why Do Buses Come in Threes? or How Many Socks Make a Pair? and Maths for Mums and Dads and his most recent book is Maths on the Back of an Envelope. He's also the director of Maths Inspiration which are mathematical themed uh, theatre shows for teenagers which occur up and down the UK and beyond. Uh, but today Rob has brought in a, a little curious subtraction game. It's something that everyone can play with, it's quite easy to get started with but there are some surprises along the way. But I started our conversation by asking Rob how he was coping with lockdown. Uh, lockdown is having three children at home and uh, discovering the joys of homeschooling and building uh, other work around that. So I've, I'm not short of things to do. Well, this is what I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you about homeschooling because I thought you were the person to ask because there's going to be lots of parents in your situation doing the homeschool thing and you're the author of Maths for Mums and Dads. So... Do you have any advice for the mums and dads out there? Yeah, well, good question. Of course, of course, homeschooling is more than just maths. So I'm having to learn French and everything else too. But on the maths thing, you know, I think the number one thing is making maths something that isn't homework. Because, uh, you know, what I've seen with my own kids and other people's kids, you know, you get, you get sent worksheet after worksheet after worksheet and after a while, it's just a chore. And if this extends for weeks to come, um, so making maths a sort of a discovery thing or something you build around what you're doing, you know, doing that home cooking and that make that the maths exercise. Let's work these things out together. Um, and uh, shopping when we're beginning to get released out and go into shops, then estimating bills and all those kind of things that for the numeracy side. And then. And then games, you know, this is a great time for playing games, some great maths games to discover, math strategy games or counting games, depending on the age of the child. So playing games with your child is a lovely natural way to get for maths ideas to come out. Especially, I mean, I'm a huge fan of probability, dice games. Yeah, what was it that inspired you to be a mathematician as, you, as a kid? So I'm guessing you were someone who liked maths as a kid? Yeah, I mean, I was good at it, which really helps. But, um, but the kind of maths that I got into, and I, I think I was into when I was eight or nine, was puzzles. And uh, that continued through my teenage days. Um, and actually, New Scientist magazine and the Sunday Times both have weekly puzzle columns. And I started doing puzzles, and I got really immersed in it. And a guy called Martin Gardner had written lots of great books. Um, and I started reading those books. And then one day, uh, I thought I'm going to try writing a puzzle and I based it very crudely on something I'd seen some number patterns I'd seen in a cricket match and I wrote a puzzle and I sent it to the Sunday Times uh, and to my amazement they wrote back saying uh, we would like to publish your puzzle so I was suddenly at the age of 17 whatever it was I was being published in the Sunday Times uh, which is amazingly empowering and uh, that's kind of what opened the doors to of course a, a far greater obsession with all of this. So how did that, how did you get from there to your maths inspiration shows? So many years later, after working in things that involve maths and then going freelance and so on, uh, I got 
back into maths when a friend of mine that I'd worked with called Jeremy Wyndham said, why don't we write a maths book together? That book was uh, Why Do Buses Come in Threes? I actually got a copy here of the original book. Um, oh, there we are. You've got, a new, you've got the most recent edition. This is what the original one looked like with, with all these jelly beans or whatever. Came out in 1998. And um, it was about the kind of maths that Jeremy and I used to talk about in the pub um, uh, or, you know, at lunchtime you know, bus uh, queuing and uh, lotteries and things like that. And that book, when it came out, to our amazement, became a bestseller. It was uh, number one at the Science Museum for five years or something. And, and schools started approaching me saying, um, uh, could you come and go do a talk? We need someone to talk about how maths connects to the real world. So by accident, uh, that started happening. And then that was going on for a few years. But when you trek across the country and only 10 kids had turned up and the, the other schools hadn't turned up. I started thinking, let's do, let's do this properly, make it worth everyone's while. Um, and the big inspiration was to think, let's, let's do an event that schools come to, but let's not do it in a lecture hall or whatever. Let's do it in a theatre. Let's make this an experience. And the idea was to bring in a diverse range of people who use math in different ways to show teenagers there's more to math than taking exams and there's lots of joyful sides of it, some of which are more abstract, some of which are very practical. Um, and really it's grown from there, the idea of live interactive shows with a bit of humour in theatres. That was, that was the key thing. And what's the reaction been to that? Uh, so when these students come to these and have these theatre experiences, which is like you said, outside of the classroom, does it, does, it, does it inspire them? Which is what we're hoping. Yeah, I think, I mean, of course, there's a lot of different reactions. To me, uh, I mean, a lot of kids who like maths come along and they like it even more. They love it. You're, you're not converting them. You're just affirming, yeah, it's OK to like it. There's lots of other people like you. But for me, the success is always the overheard comment from one a teenager who's turned up saying to their friend, that was better than I expected. In other words, they really didn't want to go. No one was going to go to a math show, but it's an afternoon off school and the teacher said we had to go and they turn up and they actually enjoy it. And those are the people that you think I am changing their views. And I know what you bring is you bring your love of puzzles to maths inspiration. So I think uh, this might be a good opportunity to talk about what you have brought in uh, to show people which, by the way, I know what you're going to bring in, and I think it's going to be a great thing to talk about because I think this is something for everyone to do. I think it'd be for adults and children and everyone to play with. So I'm going to ask you, what have you brought in today? So uh, this is um, a, uh, it's kind of um, half puzzle, half game, half curiosity. That's three halves, that makes one and a half. It can't be that, it's a third of those. So this is a little game um, a subtraction game that is really used with seven, eight-year-olds normally to encourage them to learn how to subtract. So let me show you the idea. What you do is you draw a square and then at the corners of the square you can put any numbers you like. So let's take some nice easy numbers, 6, 18, 7 and 22. And all you have to do is find the difference between the numbers at each corner and write the difference in the middle. So 12, 11, 15, 16 and then you join those together to make a diamond it's very pretty and then you do it again so four one four one and a square and you get this lovely pattern of of squares and diamonds going in but hang on a sec three 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 zero 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 can't go any further so that's that's it we've we've done our diffy squares we can actually count them up and there's one, two, three, four, five Diffy squares here. So this kind of thing, I'm sure anyone watching this might think, you know what, I fancy having a go at this myself. Um, and you can pick any numbers you like. If you want, you can repeat numbers. So I've got three, 12, 12, seven here. So you might think, okay, what's that gonna do? I'm gonna not get as many Diffy squares now because I've got two repeating. Maybe I'll get four. So let's just check. That's one. And there's the differences, two three, four, five, still five. That's interesting. And I love it because when you start playing with things like this, you start saying, uh, I wonder. And in this case, I wonder, I don't know, what are you wondering? Maybe, does it always end with zeros? 
or does it sort of get into some pattern that that's not all zeros? Is it always five squares? And if it isn't always five squares, how can I make it not be five squares? Actually, I've thought of one way straight away. I've put five, 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 five at the corners and then it's zero straight away, so it's only two. But, but can I get more? Do big numbers make a difference? So let's try. I thought I'd be, push the boat out. Four, 70, 122, and 6,412,508. Right, this will keep us going for a while. So how many more squares are we gonna get? Now we've got this mega number here. I don't know, have you, are you gonna make a punt at how many more we'll get? I'm going to say, hmm, let's go for, I'm going to go for five squares again. I wonder if it's always five squares. Well, it's five. Let's see if you're right. It's either five or it's going to explode. You'd think one of the two. Let's see. There's two, mm. three, four, five, six. We've added one more, all that extra effort. So it's not always five, it's six. But well, that was a lot of effort to get an extra square. Um, what about these? Here's some nice, nasty numbers. 2.718, or that was a little approximation to E, the, the base of natural logarithms, pi. Okay, stuck those four. Now, here at last, this, this was me experimenting thing when, when my kids had been playing with it. I thought, right, they've gone to bed. I'm just going to break this thing. So let's find a way. And I need a calculator to tell me the difference between these numbers. Um, so, uh, I'm actually going to use the number E on my calculator here and I'm just, I'm just going to write it out as the letters and symbols. I'm not going to write the decimal places. All right, so it's already looking messy, but hang on a sec. Root 7 plus E minus 1 minus pi four times. We're back to five. We are back to five. Now, what I love about this is it's kind of instantly mysterious. It's a simple, simple game. What is going on? Something not obvious is going on when really complicated numbers can throw up um, a, uh, a, you know, just can, can destroy themselves in five goes. And you begin to think, well, okay, it's going to be four, four, five, six every time or zero or whatever. But um, if you, uh, ex if, if you uh, play around, and create your own Diffy squares, you might do what my daughter did. She just happened to pick these numbers. This was pure chance. Two, four, seven, 13. They are very innocent looking numbers. Looks like it's gonna be a, what are those fives? Here's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Just from those numbers. Now, I find that gobsmacking what is it about those numbers so what is the secret behind those numbers that we have with the 10 diffy squares i'm going to give you a little puzzle here what comes next zero one one two four seven what now it's one of those things it could be a lot of things but i'm wondering if you'll come up with the number i'm thinking of here um can you see a rule or a pattern? There might be. No, I can see a rule. Okay. Uh, I think the next number is 13. Oh, interesting. So give me your reasoning for that. Uh, so it reminds me of Fibonacci. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, where Fibonacci, you add the previous, yeah, go on, yeah. the previous two numbers. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work. So I'm wondering if it's adding the previous three numbers. Yeah, so two plus one plus one is four. One, two, four makes seven. Two, four, seven, 13. Well, well done. That is what I was thinking of, which is not necessarily, there might be other patterns that fit too, but here's the thing. These, these have a nickname, they're called Tribonacci numbers, which is lovely, it's a little pun on Fibonacci. But those four numbers, two, four, seven, 13, those are the four numbers at the corners of the square that made the 10 Diffy squares. So there they are. And that was it. But the order matters. It's not just those four numbers. If I swap the bottom two, we lose two of our middle squares. So it's about the order as well, which is lovely. But again, it's, it's kind of, it hasn't solved our mystery. 
Um, but that, uh, that sequence, there's the Tribonacci numbers again. Uh, and if you take each term in the, uh, the Tribonacci sequence and divide it by the previous one, the further you go along, the nearer it gets to a, a number known as the Tribonacci constant. And I'm going to show this to you. Uh, look away, anyone who doesn't like scary looking uh, formulae. It's called the Tribonacci constant. There it is. How's about that? One plus the cube root of 19 plus three square root of 33. Sorry about my notation there, but hopefully you can sort of tell what it is. A messy looking number, which is, uh, oh, off the top of my head, I think it's about 1.8 something. Um, and, uh, and here's an interesting thing, because if you stick that number in the corner of a Tribonacci, uh, of a Diffie square, sorry, um, then whatever you do, don't also put that number in the bottom right hand corner and square it. And if you do do that by accident one day, please don't do that in the bottom left hand corner as well and cube that. Because if you do that and try to get your Diffie squares out, you'll find that they go on forever. You get an unkillable Diffie or a Diffie zombie. It's the only thing that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't end in zeros, which is kind of freaky. Um, so there we are. I mean, it's, it's something anyone can play with. And um, I like, you know, it's a little challenge because people can try out um, using whole numbers from one to 50. What's the pattern with the most Diffie squares? Can you get more than five? Can you get more than seven? Can you get more than 10 Diffie squares? Uh, playful, because a, a six-year-old can probably have a go at this and uh, any other age group older than that can certainly have a go at this. Uh, so it's just delightful. Uh, one of those examples of a bit of maths that anyone can have a go at, very low threshold for getting into, but it's the maths behind it goes a long way, which is, I think you'll agree, we love that kind of maths that goes very deep from a lovely simple principle. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I hope people will be trying out your challenge and finding out the most Diffie squares. Uh, I'm, I think, I'm going to say thank you for bringing that thing. Uh, is there anything you want to plug while we're here? Uh, there's two two areas that I get involved with. Apart apart from math inspiration, um, if people like puzzles, I I still am involved in puzzles. Um, I'm I'm uh, responsible for. I kind of advise on a, a weekly puzzle column in a magazine called New Scientist. So the New Scientist puzzle every week uh, is a, is the kind of puzzle I think is is right and challenging and interesting. So look out for that. If you're looking for uh, stuff of mine or books or whatever, my most recent book, which uh, says a lot about the kind of maths I'm interested in, another everyday maths book. Uh, I've got some up here. I'll just reach out to my bookshelf. There we go. Um, is this one. It's called Maths on the Back of an Envelope. It's a, an easy read and it's about the important area of um, estimation and just having a feel for numbers because I think when it comes to everyday maths, uh, having a sense of numbers and being able to roughly figure things out is such an important life skill, being able to interpret statistics. Um, so that's my sort of uh, aid to anyone who wants to get back into thinking, oh, how do you work these things out again? And I can thoroughly recommend that. Uh, so I want to say thank you, Rob, for coming in and showing us Diffie Squares. Thank you, James. Hey everyone, I want to thank Rob once again. Do check out his books, but for now I want to say stay curious and I'll see you next time.